ones, obvious, or else you are really heavy sleepers and the fireworks did not keep you up last night. I don't know which one it is, but we are glad that you're here with us to worship Jesus this morning and celebrate true freedom, right? Freedom that we have in Christ, freedom from death, freedom from sin because of what Christ did on the cross and the resurrection for us and super thankful for that. So we are glad that you're here with us this morning. Hopefully you grabbed a bulletin when you came in. They are on the welcome desk uh, in a basket there. You grab one of those bulletins. You can see all the things that are going on in the church and all the happenings that we have going on. Uh, one of the things that is in the bulletin is a brightly colored sheet that is called a care card. That care card is used for a couple of different reasons. One is if you would like to have the church, off uh, the church office to have your information, you can fill up that top part if something has changed or you've never given the church office your information and would like for them to have it, uh, you're more than welcome to do so with that. Uh, but what we feel is the most important part of that care card is the stuff that's on the bottom. And that is um, where you can put your prayer request. If there's anything that you would like prayer for, uh, either where you want just the elders to be praying for, or if you like the whole church to be praying for you, we encourage you to fill out that care card. Know that we, um, we value prayer and we... Uh, are thankful for the gift of prayer, and we believe in the power of prayer. So if there's something that we can pray for you about, just put that at the bottom. There's two baskets in the back of the sanctuary there that you can drop off those care cards uh, when you leave this morning. Uh, those baskets are also in the back for giving. If you want to leave your offering, you're more than welcome to do that in those baskets, or you can go online and give on the church website, FremontEFree.org. Uh, we have some exciting things coming up. Vacation Bible School is a week away. I don't know if you noticed in front of the welcome desk, there's some decorations. Uh, that's just to let you know VBS is coming. Uh, it is a week away. N a week from Monday is when Vacation Bible School begins. We're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a super fun time. I know there's a lot of a lot of people who've done a lot of work just to get everything ready to go for that. And so um, it's going to be the 11th through the 14th, uh, Monday through Thursday. From 6 to 8.15 is the time that will be. And it's for kids entering kindergarten uh, through completion of 6th grade is who can come and be a part of Vacation Bible School. And you can register at the church website. If you just go to FremontEFree.org, there's a place that you can re register for VBS and get the kiddos signed up for that. Now, I also want you to be aware, two weeks from today, uh, we are going to offer our next baptism class. We offer baptism classes about once a quarter. If you've never um, participated in Believer's Baptism and you would like to, what we would encourage you to do is do one of two things. One, on that care card, you can write baptism, put your name on it, obviously, so we know who you are, and put baptism. Or uh, you can talk to me and let me know, and we would love to sign you up for the baptism class. That is two weeks from today. It'll be right after the second service. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour uh, we will meet in the youth room, and uh, if you are interested in participating in Believer's Baptism, we just take this time to talk about baptism, uh, what it means, why do we practice it, uh, what does it represent, and so we would love to have you come and be a part of that class. All right, our scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 53. This is a great passage about the suffering servant who we know is Jesus, and all that he is going to do for us. And so what I would encourage you to do is the first song that we're going to sing this morning is, called, is a song called God is For Us. We've sung this song for a little while now. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about what does it mean when we say God is for us? Isaiah 53 is a great example of the length to which we realize how much God is for us with all that Jesus did on our behalf to secure our salvation. So as I read this passage in Isaiah 53, just be thinking, this is how much God is for us. This is a real tangible way to see that and to celebrate that as well. And so it's going to be on the screen for you to follow along as I read. I'm going to be reading Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 10 that if you could stand with me in honor of reading God's word. This is Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one whom men would hide their faces. 
He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit on his mouth. Yet it was the, Lord, the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul made an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The Lord and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that when we read Isaiah 53 and this prophecy of the suffering servant that was all fulfilled in the work of Christ in his suffering in the cross and his death for us. And this was the Lord's will to do this to him in order to secure our salvation when we were enemies and running from god is is truly amazing it's wonderful it's astounding and we say thank you and i pray that when we read this and sometimes we can wonder god are you really for me that we can look at Isaiah 53 and know with confidence that, yes, God is for us because Jesus has done everything that needed to be done to make us right with God again. Bore our sin, bore our shame, took our judgment, took the wrath, took the punishment for us in order that we could be brought to you. And that means that you are always for us. And so for that, we thank you, and we want to worship you now and celebrate the greatness of who you are and that you would work in us in such an amazing way. And so for that, we say thank you. Thank you for being for us. Thank you for sending Christ, that before Christ, we were estranged, but now we have been brought near. We glorify you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
so we read in Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And now what we're going to do is we're going to sing about those things. We're going to sing, it is finished upon that cross. We're going to sing, Jesus paid it all. And so now that we can, uh, what we've read, now we can express in a joyful song of praise for what Jesus did. So let's continue to sing and remember and celebrate all that God has done for us in Christ.
God, we thank you that you paid it all. We had a large debt that we could have never repaid, and you paid every bit of that. So God, I pray that not only we would be thankful, but that we would treasure you, that we would see that this is the greatest gift that we have ever received, the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that we would treasure you above all things. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So today is a big day. We are sending 33 students and nine sponsors to Challenge Conference. This is a national conference put on by the E3 denomination, which we are a part of. Uh, it happens every other year. It actually, it's been four years since the last one happened because COVID wiped out 2020. So we are excited that our students get to go and be a part of Challenge again for the first time in four years. Um, there's, I don't know, I don't think they're all in here, but a lot of them are in here. I'm, so I'm going to ask students, uh, sponsors that are in the room, would you stand so that everybody can just see who you are? Just kind of look around for a moment. They're kind of spread out all over the place. So what you see on the screen, have a seat, guys and gals, thanks a lot. What you see on the screen is um, five prayer points that our youth leader, Seth, has put together. That he said, we would like you to pray these things for our students and for our leaders who are going to be going uh, to challenge this week. They're going to leave actually after this service. They're getting on a bus to head out, and they will be gone. They will come back on Friday. And so these prayer points are up here. And so prayers, like I said earlier, prayer is something that we value. A couple times a month, we like to stop in our service and take time to intentionally pray for various topics. Today we're going to pray for our students and leaders who are going to challenge. And those five prayer points you can see on the screen there are the things that we want to be praying. Pray for a conviction of sin that leads to repentance. Pray for an exalted view of God that leads to a life of deeper worship. That God would help them see Him more clearly than they ever have before. Pray for spiritual transformation that impels each student into the next step in their walk with the Lord. Pray that our students who are unregenerate would be saved. And pray that our students who are saved would be convicted and transformed by the renewing of their minds. So these are the things that we want to be praying for those that are headed to Kansas City uh, today for challenge. So what I would ask you to do is we're going to take a few minutes. If you could gather together with the people that you came with today, the people that you're sitting with, your family or whoever else that you're sitting with here, your church family, and let's just spend um, some minutes praying these things for our students as they head to challenge. Let's go ahead now and take time and let's pray.
Father God, I thank you for the prayers of the saints. To hear the, the church family praying for one another is, is a true blessing and an encouragement. Thank you that you heard each and every single one of these prayers that was made. Uh, and that you're listening and that you're working. You're already moving. And I thank you for that. So I do. I want to pray for this group that is getting ready to go to a challenge here today. And I just pray that it would be an incredible week for them. Pray that it would be a week where they see you in new and different ways that they've never seen you before. And you would open their eyes to the wonder and the beauty and the worth of who God is and the wonders of Jesus Christ and the work that Jesus did on their behalf. I pray for life-changing events to take place, that they would come home different than when they left, that they would come home deeply impacted by the gospel, that they would be changed, that they would be transformed, that they would be different because of the encounter that they had with you at challenge. I pray against any distractions that may come their way uh, to keep them from learning things of you. We know that we have an enemy that doesn't want them to learn this week. So I pray that you would be working in that. And I just, um, I just ask that you would be with the sponsors, give them great strength and great wisdom. Pray for unity. Just pray that you would just really bless every moment of the trip from the moment that they leave to the moment they come home. Thank you. Lord, I ask you to be with us now. I pray that you be with Adam as he comes and brings us the word. And as we continue in, on, in the book of Acts, I pray that we would be impacted by the gospel today. Your word is powerful, and we are here to learn from your word. And not only to learn from your word, but we want to be changed by your word. We want to be transformed. We want to be conformed more into the, your image and in the likeness of Christ. So we ask that you would be doing a good gospel work here in all of us this morning. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for praying. And could I just encourage you, uh, continue to be praying for our students uh, as we go throughout this week. Well, good morning, everyone. For those of you, of you who do not know me, my name is Adam, and I serve with the elders here, and it is my privilege today to bring the Word of God to you. Um, Isaiah 53 that we read earlier today is just a great reminder to us of what God has done for us in the gospel. It's also um, a great reminder to us that the path that Jesus took was set in stone when time began. Isaiah was long before Christ walked this earth, and yet it, it tells us of what Christ would walk and what would happen. And it's a great reminder that God purposes his will and does his will. And so we'll see some more reminders of that today in Acts 21. So if you would stand with me as we read God's Word. We'll read Acts 21, verses 1 through 16. God's Word says this, And when they had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling, kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. 
On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And, see, and since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. You may be seated. Let's pray today and ask God to help. Father, we're thankful for what you have done for us in Christ and thankful for the gospel reminders that we sang about today and, and what we have read about. And we just ask that you continue to work in our hearts. We ask that if someone is here today and they haven't trusted in Christ, that your spirit would convict them of their sin and that they would turn to you. And we ask for the rest of us that your spirit would work in our hearts, that he would point out our sin, that we would learn to trust you more. We're thankful for your word and its power and your spirit and the work that it does in our hearts. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. So Kevin DeYoung in his book, Just Do Something, tells of the obituary of a fictional or maybe not so fictional man named Walter Houston. Here is what the obituary reads. Man 91 dies waiting for the will of God. Tupelo, Mississippi, Walter Houston, described by family members as a devoted Christian, died Monday after waiting 70 years for God to give him clear direction about what to do in his life. He hung around the house and prayed a lot, but just never got that confirmation, his wife Ruby says. Sometimes he thought he heard God's voice, but then he wouldn't be sure, and he'd start the process all over again. Houston, she says, never really figured out what his life was about, but felt content to pray continuously about what he might do for the Lord. Whenever he was about to take action, he would pull back because he didn't want to disappoint God or go against him in any way. Ruby says he was very sensitive to always remaining in God's will. That was primary to him. Friends say they liked Walter, though he seemed not to capitalize on his talents much. Walter had a number of skills that he never got around to using, says longtime friend Timothy Burns. He worked very well with wood and had a storyteller side to him. I always told him, take a risk, try something new if you're not happy. But he was too afraid of letting the Lord down. To his credit, they say, Houston worked mostly as a handyman, was able to pay off the mortgage on the couple's modest home. So Paul faced a similar issue in this passage before us today. The mystery or the perplexity of God's will. It's something that we talk a lot about in Christian circles, isn't it? We say phrases like, if the Lord wills, or the Lord willing, you might hear someone say, if it's God's plan, we're trying to determine God's will. It's all in God's timing. God opens and shuts doors. You'll hear people say the phrase, I don't know what God has for me. Even in verse 14 today, these disciples say, let the will of the Lord be done. We seem to be acutely aware that God has a will but we often live our lives in confusion and uncertainty about, God's, about what God's will is for us. You may find some comfort in knowing that you are not alone. We see here in this passage this morning that there was some confusion 
about God's will for Paul to go to Jerusalem. We'll look at the verses before us, but I want us to see a few main things from this passage as we dive in. I want us to see Paul's relentless commitment to the will of God to share the good news with a lost world, even when other believers were urging him not to go to Jerusalem. I also want us to think about suffering in the life of the believer and how that fits with God's will. And lastly, I want to remind us of the hope found in the good news of the gospel. The good news that Jesus died to secure for you and me, and the good news that Paul was willing to die for in order that people would hear it. So we see in the first three verses here of chapter 21 the route that Paul was trying to take back to Jerusalem. Luke is giving us real history here as it's happened. We see this voyage and this route that Paul takes. Our ESV here uses the word parted in verse 1. Jim touched on this some last week about the intensity of the departures when Paul's friends know where he is headed. Several translations use the phrase, torn ourselves away from them, instead of the word departed, to help, to help show the intensity of this departure. These are, these are emotional times for everybody that's involved here. Put yourself in their shoes. Think of your most dear friend telling you he is going to head someplace, that he might be killed. This is hard stuff here, and these, these people love Paul. Paul was the one who had brought them the good news. Paul was the one who had led them and taught them. He was an important figure in their lives, who they, who they respected and who they loved. And now it's time for Paul to leave. And as far as they were concerned, he was leaving for the last time. So Paul leaves, and they eventually end up in this city called Tyre, which I don't know if that's where Goodyear started or not, but it was a city called Tyre, which is this city in Lebanon. It's about 100 miles away from Jerusalem, 100 miles north. So it would be about where Yankton, South Dakota is from us. They stop here because the ship needs to unload its cargo, and we see that in verse 3. Now this is where things start to get a little strange here. A few months ago when we were getting the schedule together for the, the summer preaching schedule, and Acts 21 fell to me, I read the first three verses, and I was like, okay, I think I, I, think I understand what's happening here. Um, I got to this verse, and I was immediately wishing that I had been assigned a different passage. So, so what in the world is going on here? Has the Apostle Paul been refusing to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit this entire time? Has he been so determined to go to Jerusalem that he's made all of this up? Or are the people here wrongly interpreting the warning that the Spirit is giving? On the one hand, it'd be easy to decide with the disciples who discouraged Paul. Luke tells us that the disciples spoke to Paul in verse 4 through the Spirit. This is a compelling argument. It appears to be the one time that Paul is ignoring the Holy Spirit. Has Paul's determination to visit Jerusalem hindered his ability to heed the Spirit's warnings? On the other hand, Paul has been trying to get to Jerusalem for a while. Back in chapter 19, verse 21, we read that it was in the Spirit that Paul resolved to go. Chapter 20, verse 22, it says, Paul told the Ephesian elders that he was constrained by the Spirit to go. In verse 23 there, we see that Paul had, that the Spirit had already warned Paul that dangers awaited there, but that never discouraged him from going. This narrative really is kind of perplexing, isn't it? Let's talk for a few minutes about the Lord's perplexing providence. It's clear that the Holy Spirit is warning Paul, but is Paul supposed to go to Jerusalem, or is he supposed to prepare for the suffering that awaits? Or is he supposed to avoid going there, or is he supposed to prepare for the suffering? What's more likely, that Paul is ignoring the Holy Spirit for the first time, or that the disciples are misunderstanding the purpose of the warnings? In other words, in verse 4, is this the, is this the case of the Holy Spirit saying, Paul, you better not go to Jerusalem, and Paul just saying, I'm going to go anyways, or is there more to it than that? 
If you read Christians who have thought about this question and researched it over the years, you come up with different answers. One commentator that I read who has thought about it very deeply, he said that as good of a man as Paul is, he's a flawed man. And his zeal for his countrymen overrode his zeal to obey God. He became blinded to God's leading at this point by the Spirit. And in his view, Paul was disobedient, but God worked through it. On the other hand, there are some who would look at this and say, well, it's possible that's what hap- that what is happening here is that the Holy Spirit has told these disciples what awaits Paul, and these disciples have then taken it upon themselves to interpret this as Paul shouldn't go to Jerusalem. You could look, for example, at Paul's previous sensitivity to the leading of the Spirit, that every time we see prior to this, when the Holy Spirit says, Paul, don't go someplace, Paul says, okay, I'm not going to. So why would he, why would he change now? You might also ask why, as you look at the events of Paul's journey to Jerusalem, why does it parallel so closely to the events in Jesus' life in going to Jerusalem or to the cross? There's a lot of comparisons here. And some people say, well, it's actually comparison. Some people say, well, it's actually contrast. And there's people who debate this. Was Paul obedient? Was Paul disobedient? At this point, there are perplexing questions about that. Personally, I think Paul is walking in obedience, particularly when we look back at previous chapters where Paul is talking about wanting to go to Jerusalem, not counting his life dear to himself so that he would finish the race with joy and ministry which he had received from the Lord. But there are people who believe otherwise. Either way, how God is working, sometimes it isn't immediately obvious to us, is it? Sometimes we're perplexed. Sometimes we're confused. But this is the path that the Lord has for Paul to walk. Why is everyone trying to stop him? And we're not talking about people who are enemies of the gospel. We're talking about people who are friends of the gospel. As we continue on, we see down in verse 8 that the voyage continues. They come to the house of Philip. Philip here is called an evangelist. Earlier in Acts, he's actually one of the seven deacons who were chosen. Philip has four unmarried daughters who prophesied. We're not told anything, but that they prophesy. However, we are told that Agabus comes down from Judea, and he prophesies. Agabus, we've already encountered earlier in Acts. Paul worked with him previously in getting relief for believers that were in need. So let's look at Agabus' prophecy in verse number 11. It says, In coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hand of the Gentiles. So again, is this something that's trying to stop Paul, or is this something that's trying to prepare Paul? Why would God have Agabus tell him this if Paul already knew it? There's questions like this that arise. There are some, by the way, and and I need to mention this, there are some who look at this and they say about Agabus, here is an example of how in modern prophetic revelation the prophets can get some things right and some things wrong. And that's how some people excuse some of the errors in the modern Pentecostal and charismatic movements. This is not a case of that. Agabus here is speaking by the Spirit, but he doesn't get it wrong. Here's where some people think that he gets it wrong, because Agabus says that the Jews at Jerusalem will bind this man and deliver him in the hand of the Gentiles, but you read later that it's the Romans who put chains on Paul. Well, here's the reality. What happens later in this chapter is that the Jews seize Paul, and they're trying to kill him, and more than likely they would have bound him or restrained him in some way, as they're trying to kill him. They hand him over to the Romans when the Romans come because they have no other choice. It's not a matter of the Holy Spirit giving imprecise prophecy or Agabus getting part of it right or part of it wrong. When we look at this and we think about it, it seems like a strange way for events to unfold, doesn't it? What's going on in this passage? What also stands out is what Paul says in verse number 13. 
Acts 21, 13 says, Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. But the story doesn't get any less complicated. Paul comes to Jerusalem eventually. He's received well by the Jerusalem church. He tells them what God has done, and they glorify him. But ultimately, we know that things take a turn later for Paul, don't we? It seems to be a very perplexing thing. Yet if Paul did not go on to the temple later on in Acts, he would not have been grabbed by the Jews there. If he wasn't grabbed by the Jews there, he wouldn't have been rescued by the Romans. If he hadn't been rescued by the Romans, he wouldn't have been put into Roman chains. And if he had not been put into Roman chains, ultimately he would never have reached Rome. But even though we see in, Paul li- in Paul's life how God has worked all of this out, how God used even this to bring the gospel to Rome so that Paul was, was able not only to preach to his own countrymen, but also to preach to those in Rome, we still might ponder and wonder why it must have happened this way. Could not there have been an easier way for Paul and the gospel to get to Rome? So we also, at times, will walk in this path of God's providence that doesn't immediately make sense to us. I immediately thought of the cross when we were reading this passage and the path that Christ took to save his people. The way that God works often makes the least sense to us, doesn't it? Think of all the things that Christians get from the cross that don't make sense at the face value of it. We get life from death, we get pardon from penalty, and we get justification from judgment. The longer we walk and the more that we see God and how God is moving in us and our circumstances that he's bringing into our lives, the, the more we're confronted with the truth that's expressed in Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Or as Proverbs says in Proverbs 20, verse 24, a man's steps are of the Lord. How then can a man understand his way? The path of providence is perplexing. We won't get it all. In fact, there's going to be times in our lives where we just can't seem to figure it out. God's providential plan was perplexing for Paul, just like God's providential plan can be perplexing for us. But not only that, you'll see here in Acts that God's providence can sometimes be painful. What happens in Paul's experience? Well, we've we've already read some of the pain that Paul has experienced in the book of Acts, but we know what happens. Paul eventually dies at the hands of the Romans, but we we read several accounts of, of pain and problems that Paul faces in the New Testament. The path of providence can be painful, and Paul testifies to that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you guys want to turn there, you can. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. Take a look there with me, if you would. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 28. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, lest one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul could testify that God's path was painful. We may not all experience the same kind of pain. We may not all have the same degree of pain. 
We may not all have the same type of pain, but the path of providence can be painful. Verse 14 is not lost on us here. Let the will of the Lord be done. If we think we're going to make it through this life pain-free, we have another thing coming. Don't believe false teachers that will say, hey, if you follow Jesus, everything is going to be good in this life. You're never going to experience any difficulty. That's not true. Thank God for Paul's willingness to endure for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of God's elect. Paul would say that he suffered. He suffered evil, even to the point of change. But the word of God is not bound. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.10, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul had an eye on the bigger picture we already read previously from chapter 20 to 24, excuse me, from chapter 20, verses 22 through 24, where Paul would talk about how the Spirit had told him chains and tribulations awaited him in Jerusalem. And yet he would not be discouraged from the task that lay before him. He wanted to finish the race with joy. He wanted to finish the ministry that he had received from the Lord. Paul's path of providence was a painful one. Our particular path may be different, but Paul's example reminds us that sometimes God has a painful path of providence for us. This is not something that's in the fine print somewhere. This is something that the scripture reveals to us over and over again. Paul had told the believers at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra after he'd come back, after he had experienced so much oppression and even had been stoned and left for dead. He came back to the disciples in those very cities and he exhorted them to continue in the faith. And he said, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. That's Acts 14, 22. And it's so with us. The path of providence is painful. We must walk through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. And church, it's important that we walk this path with awareness we're not off, and we're not caught off guard with the struggle, and we don't quit because of the sorrow. As Peter tells his readers in 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Sometimes professing Christians fall for false advertising, and they think that suffering shouldn't be part of their lives. And so when the tough times come, they don't understand it. They think that something's wrong. They think that God has forgotten them or that God has abandoned them. God hasn't forgotten you even when the path is a painful path. And we must be aware of that and not be blindsided. We must not be turned aside. We must walk this path with awareness that it will be painful and sometimes perplexing. But we also can walk this path with assurance. The assurance that the presence of pain does not mean the absence of God. I want to say that one more time for those in the back. The presence of pain does not mean the absence of God. This should be our testimony. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. It says here that God will help us in our trouble. It doesn't say that we will not have trouble, but that when we experience trouble, it's God who is our refuge and our strength. He's our help in time of trouble. We have even in our own church body, those who are here right now and some who are not, we can make a long list of the painful providences that have been a part of our church body, can't we? When I look through the prayer list that we have, there is much hardship and suffering that people in this body are enduring at this very moment. And there's pain that we don't even know about yet that will come. We can think of all kinds of painful things that have happened in our church body, can't we? Look around. 
There are people who have walked hard, painful paths sitting in this church building right now. Even as we've gone through this experience of COVID the past few years and the struggles that have been associated with it, some of you have walked a painful path with regards to your physical health. Some of you have walked a painful path with regards to your emotional and your mental health. We could list all kinds of painful providences that we might never have expected that God has brought. But I don't want to end on that note. I want to bring our attention to one final point. And that is, even though the path of providence can be perplexing, even though the path of providence can be painful, ultimately, (coughs) the path to providence is perfect. I don't mean by this that we are perfect. I don't mean by this that there's no confusing things about our path. We've already established that. I don't mean to say that our path is not going to be painful. We've already established that. What I'm pointing out is that God purposes through that hard and painful path to accomplish what is perfect. What I mean by that is that God is working all things together for good. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. One of the things that we can be confident in is that God in those confusing and those painful times is working his will. He's working all things for good. He's in the process of making you and me more like Christ. He's preparing us for heaven. I do not mean that the path is never perplexing or painful, but we do know that God does all things well. Mark 7, 37 tells us that Jesus has done all things well. And when we get to heaven, this will be our testimony as well. None of us will reach heaven and will look back and be second-guessing our Savior. None of us will look back second-guessing his providence. Though now we might be very perplexed and very confused about what's happening, now we will be experiencing some type of pain now, be, now it may be confusing and we can't figure out why God is doing what he's doing, but we can know that God was and is accomplishing his purpose. He accomplished his purpose in the life of Paul. He accomplished his purpose in the life of Christ, and he's accomplishing his purpose in our lives as well. One of the amazing things that we've seen as we look at God's providence in Acts is that God, even in these perplexing and painful times, is moving to grant the desire of Paul's own heart to preach the gospel in Rome. He does all things well. We see in the life of Paul that God's providence is perfect. But what I mean by this is that his way is perfect. (coughs) Psalm 18, verse 30 said, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield to those who trust in him. So this really brings us to this point. Paul goes through this perplexing providence, this painful providence. Paul will soon be under arrest. What's going to happen and unfold as this story continues is he's going to have the opportunity to speak to his fellow countrymen, and they're going to reject him and the gospel. In chapter 23, they're going to put a plot against him to try to kill him. Paul's going to face all kinds of false accusations. But you know what? God is working out his purpose in Paul's life, just like God is working out his purpose in your life. His way is perfect. His word is proven. And he is a shield to all those who trust in in him. How should we trust in him? Well, it really starts with the gospel, doesn't it? Did Jesus, the Son of God, come to earth? Did he teach and perform miracles and heal? Did he train 12 disciples to spread the good news of his kingdom? Did he suffer while he was on earth? Did he go to Jerusalem where he was betrayed and beaten and killed? Did he do all these things without sin? Did he rise from the dead and triumph over sin and death? Is he coming again? Why did he do all these things? He did them to bring the Father glory. He 
He did them. He did it for your good. And he did it because he loves you. And this was all part of the providential plan of God. Now think about that. No matter what circumstances you're in, no matter how hard it is to understand what is happening in your life, no matter how much pain and hardship and suffering you're going through, Jesus has done all the things we just talked about for you. Your eternity is secure if you are in Christ. Your future is sure. If you're in Christ today, you're a child of the King. And let me tell you, a king's child is a pretty good place to be. So remember Walter Houston that we talked about at the beginning of the sermon today? You don't have to be like Walter. If you're in Christ, you know that you will never be snatched out of the Father's hand. And you know that everything happening in your life is for the good, is for your good to the glory of God. So Christian, rest easy tonight when you go to bed, that no matter how perplexed you are about what God is doing, no matter how much pain or suffering that you're going through, the future is perfect because the perfect king of the universe is working it all out for your good. Of this, we can be sure. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who put their trust in him. So trust in him, church. Trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you are over all things in our life. And even though sometimes we not be able to understand the pain we're going through or understand why you have brought circumstances into our life, what we can do is we can trust you because we know that you are good and we know that just like in the life of Paul, you are working out all things for our good. So Father, I ask that no matter what we're going through, that we would trust you today, that you are working your will according to your purpose. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. If you would stand for the benediction. Today I'm going to read from Psalm 121, verses 7 and 8. It says, The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You are dismissed.